The following is a presentation of Stewed Productions. Hello all, Josh here once again saying thank you so much for listening to this podcast called Inner Brews and for all the support that you give it just by listening and telling your friends and sharing it with other craft beer lovers in Texas, Houston, and beyond. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, if you would like to see this podcast uh, advance in its uh, offerings, such as video and things along those lines, uh, you may want to become a podcast supporter. Go to patreon.com slash innerbrews or innerbrews.com slash patreon, and there you can uh, support for as little as a dollar an episode and uh, help us get to those uh those milestones. If you don't want to make the commitment of every single episode, there is a PayPal donate button. You can donate there any amount you would wish if you are uh, able to do so. All of that is very much appreciated. Or perhaps you just want to use our Amazon affiliate link. Therefore, all of your purchases on Amazon go to help us help you help us help you. It's a, it's a perfect circle. Uh, and all of that being said, I just want to say thank you. And if uh, no monetary support is uh, in your budget, which I obviously, I do understand that's uh, the times in which we live, I just, again, want to say thank you for listening and ask that you uh, tell a friend, share the love. If you love it, share it with somebody you love. And uh, let's buy beers uh, and drink uh, virtually together. And then when all this is over, drink together again. All right, enough of me. Let's get on to the podcast with... Rasul and Ryan and Troy at Buffalo Bayou. Here we go. Let's do it. This is Interbrews. All right. Welcome in, everybody. Uh, another episode of uh, Interbrews during the COVID Chronicles, what we're calling them, Rasul. Uh, it's. Um, you know, it's just the life we're living right now, but uh, it, we're able to talk and I'm able to see your view. I wish everybody could see the view that I'm seeing. No, Troy, I was talking about you. Uh, stay right there, buddy. <laughs> uh, so with us today, Razul, Troy, uh, Ryan, who, is anybody else around? Uh, the, the whole crew at Buffalo Bayou. That yeah, basically. <laughs> How's it going, man? It's going well. It's going well, you know. Um, I guess I would describe it as we're treading water and we're not drowning. So that's uh, that's the best you can hope for in these days. It's um, you know obviously it hasn't been uh, hasn't been as we expected 2020 to be. Yeah. And we had to take a hard detour on the 2020 strategic plan, but we did prepare for this uh, a couple of years ago. It's hard to kind of imagine that we'd prepare, but we did prepare for zero revenue uh, sort of situations as we were jumping from one facility to the other, and so we were. We're able to get a little bit of a head start on some of the evasive maneuvers that you need to take as a business to make sure that you can um, kind of weather a storm like this. So we've been very fortunate in that regard. Oh, man. And, and, and as you look at these two guys right next to me, I mean, and the whole team uh, that's actually doing work while we're drinking. By the way, what am I doing? Nice. There's that more cowbell. We've got cotton <laughs> fever. So I've been just chugging these fuckers. It's so bad. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that out loud, no, but, but no, nah, the team's been phenomenal and, and um, it's just been un unbelievable, the, the camaraderie and, you know, I'm, I'm asking the team for a lot right now. We've got a lot of uncertainty and I'm asking them to hunker down and have the patience to trust our leadership and to know that we have a plan and everyone has been just magnificent. I mean, the brew team's making the best liquid they've ever made in their entire lives. We've got more quality data points than ever and we're knocking them all out of the park the uh, sales team is out there crushing it we rolled into 2020 with a lot of momentum we were up about 60 percent last year while the rest of the market was down two to five percent uh, our cans have actually accelerated that trend we're up 75 percent in, in april so we're really lucky there yeah and then the hospitality team had it has had the most emotional run over the last you know four to six weeks yeah and my, uh, my leadership team in that group, you know, Chef Arash, Chef, Chef Arash Karak and, uh, and Taylor, our GM, and uh, Freddie, our AGM, and, and just the whole team, you know, Patty, our kitchen manager, Andrew, our sous chef, like they're just, they're fucking monsters and they're just tearing up. And, and, and then the, the brightest star of them all, Katie Barrett, our, uh, our events manager, she basically just like rewrote our logistics plan and I didn't have to do much of anything for it. I got to focus on the conversations we had to have with the banks and investors. Yeah. 
So it's just been unbelievable the way uh, people at the front, the middle, and the top of our organization have just rallied and just said, this is what we got to do, and we're just going to fucking put both hands on this shit sandwich, open our mouths wide, and <laughs> suck it down, bitches. Let's do this. <laughs> Fuck that virus, right? Because what are you going to do, right? Mope? Yeah, so. uh, yeah, exactly. That's one of like, our conversations leading up to this, ep- uh, this show. It's been... That really is. It's like, what can you do when, when you're faced with all of this? What are the options? Right? You can, yeah. you can get down. Well, I've got a PowerPoint slide for that, Josh, if you want it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, yes. Bring that up when uh, we've got a whole and thing. Shore right? up your core and diversify revenue streams. Yeah. A and B. I'll tell you the number one thing you do, if anyone's listening, if I can just jam my unsolicited advice in anyone's ear. Please. Do not, do not let your team go. We, uh, we, we were in a really tough situation, but we were able to defend 27 jobs on the hospitality side and then hire back another uh, probably five on the brew team side. And uh, I'm calling it a Noah's Ark strategy because, uh, you know, we're going to see a V or U-shaped recession on this. We might see a W, but I think it's probably going to look more like a V than a U. And that means that, you know, with 24 to 48 hours notice, we got to ramp the machine back up and we got to get off and running, you know. So we... Um, we, we didn't cut, uh, we, you know, we, we didn't cut a single job on our core team. Uh, we didn't, we obviously we had hours that evaporated when the city shut us down. And so we had to constrict hours and we did it in a way to make sure that our team would collect unemployment and then we'd hire them right back as soon as, as soon as the upswings back up, you know, so everyone was on the same page and 99% of our, our team understood what, what the shot was and, and we, we did it in a really ethical and humane and honest way with everyone. But we defended almost 30 jobs. Uh, and, and it, well, we've got 60 jobs total in the whole organization that we've defended. But, you know, 27 on the hospitality when we would have probably cut a lot leaner if we were a, just a restaurant, you know. Yeah. So I feel really good about that. And then that has... That really paved the way on the front end to a lot of really great culture moments where the whole team understood we're all in this together. And, uh, yeah, so it, it, kind know, of rambling because, no. to be honest, like, as a leader, you know, we're all scared because of the uncertainty. And you're like, I, I hope this is the right answer. Uh, but uh, no answer is worse than the, a slightly off-kilter answer. So yeah, you just got to move fast and make it happen. I think, I think most people... I think most people understand the need for, you know, flexibility and like just letting the whole thing hash out. Cause I don't know about you. I've never lived through a pandemic. <laughs> so you what? I've never lived through a pandemic. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. But it turns out that this is kind yeah. of a new thing. I mean, right? there was a Rick rolling thing for a while there and that really caught, that really felt like a pandemic, right? Like <laughs> yeah. you're afraid to open your phone and then suddenly like, what? And then, and then, uh, you know, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about this one on the air. I know Troy will be appreciative of it, but there was a meat spin pandemic that hit all of our college, uh, laptops, uh, right around the early aughts, you know? So these are the pandemics that I've suffered through in my existence, you know? Meat spin Mary is named Justin Strait. Oh my God. We're naming names. He's naming names. (laughs) Names have been named. You're on notice, Justin Strait. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, oh, boy. <laughs> all right. Sorry, we still love you. And if you're in Galveston, they're open. Go out and support them, man. Brews Brothers, great burgers. They're doing food together. Yeah. Here to go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome guys. Man. 10 a.m. cowbells, and this is the shit that comes out. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> you're welcome. If, uh, uh, Hashtag I'm... appreciate you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That, you know that maybe that those are the things we have to look back on. It's like how did I don't know it, 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 the timing part of this right is just um, kind of blows my mind. Kind of to veer off into that, but you mentioned how you guys were moving from the original, the OG uh, location to your new beautiful location, and how the the planning for that was then. You know, you didn't realize that you had a strategy, like a framework for a strategy to handle something that you had no idea was coming. But then, it's- yeah, well, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what we did do, Josh. And and this is why, like, it's not necessarily that we knew something was coming. It's just that you just don't know what's coming. Yeah. So you prepare for all outcomes. We knew for for five years we planned. I mean, this is our five year plan. and We've been planning and we're like, look, we're going to be most vulnerable from. Uh, disruption perspective. We don't know what's going to disrupt us, 
but we're going to, in our first 90 days of opening up the facility, we're only six, we're five and a half months into this beast. Yeah. We're still figuring out how to get in and out of the building. Like, <laughs> I don't even have my badge access to the, to the employee door still because we've just been distracted uh, getting all that sort of stuff set up. So we always knew we're going to have growing pains and the and liquidity solves all problems and invest in diversified revenue streams. I mean, for the first time, I think, in the beer industry, we're talking about, you never thought, you know, when we looked up, we never thought that these three revenue streams would be completely uncorrelated cash flows. We're talking about we sell cans through supermarkets and gas stations. We sell kegs to bars and restaurants. We sell things to people who come to our brewery. We sell them, you know, pints. We sell them glasses. We sell them T-shirts. But these are three distinct and uncorrelated cash flows. And you would have expected distributed and on and on-site sales to be diversified. But in reality, actually, on-site sales and on-premise sales turn to be perfectly correlated. So some people realize that 100% of their revenues were 100% correlated with a certain buying process. And, I mean, at, at a very – well, this is boring as fuck. I'm sorry. No, I find it, I find it <laughs> I get really nerdy when I drink cowbell at 10 a.m. <laughs> but anyways. No, I, I find it interesting, super interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, well, this is – and I know you're – like the people who listen, y- y'all's people are, your people are better people and you guys know more about the industry than the average bear. So that's why I take a little bit extra time to Please. just tell the whole, like the whole thought process of what's going through. Well, not everything that's going through my head because that's really fucking scary. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, but like most of the stuff where you're like, well, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to be distracted. We're going to be scared. We're going to be moving. We're going to be learning things. Everything that we knew at NOLDA, we're not going to know at summer. We're going to rewrite SOPs, but then some SOPs are the same as they've always been. It's a very disorienting process. Okay, so you're going to go into a year of disorientation. What do you need to do? You need to make sure the fire trucks are still around the corner. So we're, we're really fortunate in that regard. And uh, you know, we've been engaging our bank since January for a 2020 capital strategy that we laid out two years ago where we're like, hey, guys, so this thing went this way, this thing went this way. We were hoping for this card on the turn, and it came after all. So uh, we're ready to put some more chips in uh, betting on the river. So, yeah, you know, it's calculated bets. There's still a lot of uncertainty, but you're you're working methodically through the process. Yeah, does that make sense? No, I'm kind of rambling. No, it, 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 I'm glad you brought up Hold'em because I was teaching my daughters Hold'em. <laughs> it's right? just, yeah, exactly. Just, just, well, it's yeah. like because you get pocket aces pre-flop, and that flop will fuck those pocket aces up, and yeah. you can lose all your money. Yes, right. I'm just glad I'm not the only parent teaching their kids to gamble right now. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta, we gotta pay the mortgage somehow. I gotta take some money off of somebody. They're the closest one, so it's like, sorry, I love <laughs> oh you, but God, uh, right? we need a roof. <laughs> oh man, the next generation's so fucked too. Oh, I know. How are you right? gonna pay for the PPP? <laughs> oh, your future earnings after you pay for the student loan debt. Sorry, hashtag we'll be dead anyway. <laughs> yeah. But at least they have trees to walk under. That- oh, JK. <laughs> LLZ. <laughs> yeah. You fuck your children in their future. Yes. <laughs> love, love the current image. Anyways, were we talking about beer? Yeah. No, that's the thing. Y'all, you can do is drink. So it's like. This yeah. is when we transition from more cowbell to Whitmire's whiskey yes. at 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of them, big shout out to them. They uh, all the hand sanitizer and everything. I just saw their post yesterday. They are just killing it. With... I fucking love those guys. Yeah, Travis. And them. Like, the sun. The sun literally shines out of their ass. I fucking love those guys. They're making the best whiskey. Uh-huh. I, 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 yeah. Well, and I, I brought Ryan in because I wanted Ryan to tell you about what is awesome. Yeah. Mm. That's, so really, that's, that's, that's really good. That's coffee. their single barrel bourbon. Not in your coffee. That's a hundred. <laughs> it's a hundred and sixty dollar <laughs> bottle. You don't <laughs> pour it in your fucking coffee, don't tell Troy. Me what to do on vacation, Russell? Yeah, <laughs> Troy's in on vacation today. Okay. He wanted to talk to you. So. Oh, awesome, Troy. Thank you, sir. Because he wanted to, well... I'm, I wanted an excuse to drink it 10 a.m. Yeah. Other than being on vacation. Yeah. No, it's it's all good. I don't know what's wrong with my people. I give them paid time off and they come here anyway. No, I think that's... I, it's like, what? 
<laughs> um, I needed to pick up beer for vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Fair speaking enough. of, let's, I mean, as we're going through this thing, uh, beer to go, a big thing. I think everybody in Texas is making a big push this weekend. I, I yeah, I, I see the hashtag of the beer to go or what, all that. Beer it's run. like, yeah, the beer run, the, you know, it's like, I, I just felt like that was the whole time, but yeah, get out there and, and, and uh, you know, support your local brewery and go get some beer to go. But I'm, I'm beer to go in with some great white. Buffalo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. This Thank is, you. um, can I tell you, Russell, I mean, the, Beers. Tell Ryan, it's his liquid. All right, Ryan, both of you guys, all of you guys, I just want you to know, one, proper glassware, because, uh, whatever, because I'm a, I'm a nerd, but uh, ah. it's, um, we were sitting out back, me and my wife were sitting out back two nights ago, just in our backyard, in our little safe space, with uh, the flowers and the sun setting and everything else, and then just sipping on this beer, and it's just, it's like sunshine in a glass. It's like a, it's like a liquid sunset or something i don't it's just it was just magical like all of it came together and it was just it's the perfect beer it's a great like brunch beer as well but it goes yeah. great with sunsets i'm just gonna say great with sunsets with your honey boo thank you yeah it's mm, i love that beer that that it's a it's so drinkable it's just so like enjoyable i'll be honest with you i just I yeah, hesitate so, to open it up some because I end up drinking the whole six pack just right away. It's just one right after the other. It's so good. Anyway. So our, our our favorite beers growing up were uh, you know I love Allagash White, Celis White. I mean these are just magnificent white beers. Rascal. You have White Rascal, yeah. So yeah. you were I forget like how do you build that the yeast profile? I remember you were suppressing esters. So that that's um, sorry, that might, um, it was forbidden fruit. Forbidden, at first. It's the forbidden fruit uh, lye yeast strain, mm. uh, which is, I believe, the uh, Ho Garden, or that's the lineage or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we we ferment it fairly fairly cool to get a lot of the aromatics. Okay. No, it's yeah, it's um, you know, these beers are yeast uh, yeast driven, I guess. You know, the Belgian yeast strains and all that kind of stuff. But just the legacy of those beers, though, it's like it, when you think about that style was really what brought craft beer to Texas, you know, with yeah. Celis, Celis White back in the day, the OG. And, yeah, the, um, the first, first craft brewery in Texas. Yeah. yeah, and it's just, this. I don't know, this style, you hear a lot about, you know, hazy IPAs and all the crazy things people are doing, and but man, there's something about a, just a Belgian wit beer that's just right, you know? It's just right. Well, this- there's a reason recipes last hundreds of years, yeah. hundreds of years. And I know it's a little weird for us of all people to say that but like what i love about ryan style is he'll he'll engage uh an old school recipe understand it all the way from a history back make a clean base mm-hmm. and then audible off of that so great white buffalo was the seventh wit beer that we put out in the market and and it came because uh we were trying to get a, a cheap deal over to to uh valhalla on campus at rice <laughs> To, to get Lone Star off tap because I was like, come on, guys. Lone Star is like 90 cents a pint, but come on, man. Yeah. Like, I'm your, you're my alma mater. If, if you have St. Arnold's on tap, then you're not getting any shit from me because those are magnificent human beings. Brock is a fellow Rice alum. He does business the right way. I have immense respect for the liquid that comes out of that, that organization and every, everything, and especially now as you see the way he's conducting his business in the pandemic. I mean, I look up to these guys. Mm-hmm. So if, if my alma mater has the other alums beer on tap, I'll drink that beer and pay for it. I'll give zero fucks too, <laughs> but you didn't, you had Lone Star. So we, we, uh, we organized this like, so we're like, okay, well let's just take all these crazy whip beers and let's just sell just a base. Well, it turns out just a base is a fucking epic beer yes. <laughs> because Ryan, you know, takes the time to build, it the right way and we don't use adjuncts to kind of blur over but i think the little tricky trick in great white that i love the most is the fact that he uses two types of orange peel uh valencia and seville right so valencia is sweet well, like I, you can talk to that better than i can but it's a it's a, it's a sweeter sweeter softer as opposed to the, the bitter yeah the i remember i remember in 2011 when you when you first looked at gingerbread stout and you were making the Maltville more complex, I remember. You mean 
less complex? Well, less complex, but it was like, <laughs> well, but I, well your, your, your classic move is to do the C20, C60, C120 to yeah. kind of round out. So it's like if Thomas Jefferson said, uh, you know, why use two words when one word will do, Ryan will take a single idea and break it in half with two malts to round out the, to, to create a more robust flavor profile rather than a, a one-dimensional one. So like the way you put Carafa 2 in, or Carafa 3 or Carafa 2? Yeah, the way you put Carafa 3 into the original gingerbread recipe when you're like... <laughs> yeah, it's like... Uh, take, it's like, like yeah. take the brown sugar out. Take the black malt out, yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, stereo versus mono. I mean, you still get... A, it's still a great yes. song. But when it hits you from a different side and the different... The, the music comes in like, okay, here comes the rhythm. And then there's this solo flying over the top and you feel it in the back of your head and it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's the same. 360 degrees on your taste buds. Well, that's why Cowbell, Six Hops, Warrior, Cascade, Lemony, Tan Golding, Crystal, and Holler Tau, Yeah. All variations on the same theme of, you know, you know the, the flavor profiles, but still very like... One note, one played together. Mm-hmm. That's a way of doing it. Six, six instruments, one song. Yeah. 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 But then, yeah, just hearing it, like sitting yourself in the middle of the orchestra versus over here in the theater or whatever, you know, it's like it just, I think that's kind of like um, temperature, right? I think the, the temperature of your beer, that, that, that does it too. That's like moving around and hearing different parts. Oh, yeah. So, absolutely. Especially great white. Yeah. Man, those esters just leap out as it warms up Mm -hmm. i mean you're getting all the coriander and um all the orange peel yeah um yeah i want to recommend everybody get get some of that and drink it in their backyard uh you know around 7 30 sunset and then yeah just kind of let like i don't know it's like it looks like it's the same color as as a sunset and it just like i don't know there was just it was something magical like the music playing and the I don't know. I, I, I've been getting real emotional lately, too. What was the music playing when you were drinking? Was it like... You know what? Okay, so one song... Barry White? Or no. Or was it no. mariachi? No. I, I don't know. <laughs> it was... Uh, actually, a, a few songs have been hitting me, especially if I'm sitting there with my wife. There's this one by this group called Little Big Town, which I'm not a huge fan of that style. I, I don't know what you'd call that style. Like four, a lot of four-part harmonies and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. I'll have to look up the name of that song. It was... Um, it's a song just about the person you like it was almost like they wrote it for like being like isolated with your family and it's like the first lines are i need i need some personal space get away from me <laughs> we made it, and, it says, it. and then it says no no wait come back you know and oh it, and, my god yeah and it just hit me and they start singing these harmonies i'm like oh that's life right now yeah uh, it's gonna, also I believe that's also the high level for borderline personality disorder, but it's fine. You know, it's not really a big deal. It's not a big deal. There's no Although, border. To be fair, we are going through a 330 million person counseling session right now. Talk it, about oh, Yeah. Dude, it is emotions all day long. I find myself. All day long. I yeah. like just tearing up at the, at the goofiest. I like, I don't know, like watching Avengers movies with my kids or something. I'm like, oh, that, that Captain America, man. He's just, <laughs> he just encapsulates everything I'm feeling right now. You know, it has to work that we have to win, you know, damn cap. <laughs> yeah, man. That's awesome. So I don't know. But anyway, it was just, I, there's something about, I mean, beer, beer in and of itself is beautiful. But then when you start layering on, you know, everything that beer brings together, listening to great yeah. music, having a little something, you know, delicious to eat with it. And they play together. You're with somebody you love. You know, all that, right? It just, figured, it, then the tears, and then the, uh, a little bit of salt on the rim of your glass from your tears. I don't know. That's beautiful. But, <laughs> you know, and, and what I love about that is it, like, that's what, that's why we do this, you know? It's like, I was at GABF working in the booth, and uh, this couple had moved up to Denver from Houston, came up and said hi, and they made the comment that they're like, uh, that the, instead of a groom's cake, a groomsman cake, they had a keg of gingerbread sat mm. at their wedding. And I'm like, oh, my God. And it's like, this is this is when you have, you just melt, you know, your yeah. knees just go soft. And you're like, this is why we did it, you know. Like, this is why we work the 100-hour weeks. This is why we freak out about, you know, this thing or this thing and get worried about this or that. It's because, like, on the most important day of their lives, they wanted us, they trusted us to be a part of it. 
and to throw a little bit of gasoline on the fire of their celebration and just kind of amp it up and make yeah. it just a little bit more special. And now we're part of their story and a part of their life forever. And to, to be able to have created that and to be a part of that is just like the most humbling thing in the world. Yeah. And now I hadn't thought about it, but you're right. It's like I've made the glib joke, you know, America's got cabin fever and the only prescription is more cowbell. So, you know. <laughs> We're going to be supporting Christopher Walken for president. We're going to actually be doing a draft campaign. Yeah. Because I, I really think that he's got the leadership to get us through this. Yeah. Uh, as a nation and as a people. So we'll, we'll, be looking to, we'll be looking to get him off the sidelines in this political climate. Yeah. But I've been making that joke. But then you start thinking about it like for real. And you're like, now, wait a second. Our, our country's, you know, we're all holed up. We're all at home, you know, with various groups, you know, whatever have you. I got my dog or whatever. And the the country's kind of going through something. And we're able to be a part of that in some small way, you know, throughout this. You're, you're not able to do this. You're not able to do that. But if you are able to get on a little FaceTime with your buddies and your best your best friend. And y'all used to get together at the brewery and drink Crush City or Cowbell. And now you're doing it over a FaceTime. And mm -hmm. we get to be that in people's lives. And that's a really important thing. So that's kind of what's keeping us going in terms of thinking about the long game and why are we here and why do we do all the business. That, you know, why do we dig in, you know? Dude, while you're talking about that, I mean, groups and getting together, yeah. it's Friday. You yeah. know what we do on Friday? With yeah. Shotgun. Oh, yeah. Shotgun Friday for social distancing. I know <laughs> your listeners are members. There's 7,000 members of yes. this private group and uh i'll be looking for all of y'all shut down later on today hell yeah <laughs> it there's something about that it's so satisfying like even like people that jump on and they're doing like uh you know not it's not craft beer that they're doing but you're like yeah hell yeah do that because it's just it's like i don't know there's something like it's been quite entertaining yeah oh the the creativity that's come out of that group i uh, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. been amazing and uh what's the guy that every day it's a different outfit uh, oh, that's what, that's our good friend, Tony Drury. Tony Drury. That Shit Shotgun Tony Drury. We love he, you, brother. Yeah. He's the OG author of Shotgun Friday, right? He's like, the man who? that taught me to run a gang. His band was Shotgun Friday. They wrote the song Shotgun Friday. They are Shotgun Friday. I think man. Tony Drury is the oh, OG of OG. Well, Tony, his uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out the whole thumb. The thumb, the renegade. yeah, the thumb through the thing right there. He just does it like it's, you know, that's his superpower. Up right there, I, I only know two people in my entire life who have ever been able to successfully renegade. One man is Tony Drury, and the other man is the man, the legend to my right hand right now, my actual right hand. Yeah, Troy, don't chug against him with a spoon. I mean, when it, he's, he's such a dick. He was in a fucking dunk tank talking shit wait <laughs> that does remind me am i allowed to swear on this i'm sorry oh no it's yeah well, you yeah could, my bad no let it so let it fly it, let it fly yeah i'm sorry for your sound engineer that poor bastard. that's me yeah that guy yeah sorry you're a poor <laughs> bastard anyway so this fucking unicorn he's like in the he's in the dunk tank and he's talking shit i forget i, I might have been me throwing I forget oh my gosh. he's talking shit he's like you're gonna miss you're gonna take forever missing and while you're missing i'm gonna shotgun this cowbell he thumbs the cowbell <laughs> shotguns a cowbell while the person is throwing it he finishes it before they finish throwing it sure enough they miss oh, i was so young back then <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah back when you were 48 anyways but <laughs> so what what's oh, the so you you posted the other day you have the come and crush it logo on the can. Oh, yeah. Yes. Damien had an awesome video. Yeah. It was so cool. The there un so many great comments about the it. The uninformed might think it's upside down. No, but when you shotgun, it's right side it's up. It's right baby. side up. That's so when, when it's right, it's right side up. And and just like a little so oh my god. I was just about to show you and I realized that I I broke my own rule, but look on this can, uh -huh. the, the, the mouth, you know, you're going to have to describe it to the list. I'll describe it to listeners, but the mouth is in perfect alignment mm. with the come and crush it flag, which is basically an affront to my masculinity that I didn't <laughs> shotgun it. When you see that and you witness that, cause uh -huh. it's, it's random, you know, oh, the, yeah. the top spins. Okay. Yes, so, that's true. You know, it's a one in three hundred and sixty percent chance that you uh, <laughs> have it perfect three hundred and sixty. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's are those the actual odds? Have you calculated that? Odds, I mean, it's depending on how you look at it. Or what? <laughs> is it better or worse odds than Russian roulette, depending on Yeah, right. Yeah. What you <laughs> well, the outcome, yeah, it's like uh, that whole Russian roulette thing. The uh, totally different gun involved, but it's um, no. Is that have you calculated the odds? Is it actually one in three sixty? Was that? Is it? Have you calculated those odds and the spin rates and well, the the cans are spinning on the line as the lid falls and hits it, so it could literally be in any any orientation. So, so it's the three hundred and sixty degrees, and I just said one over three sixty. Sure. No. I guess so I guess we should probably uh, what a, sounds like science. figure out the percentage of the circumference that the <laughs> mouth is to get a li- really to shotgun it. That's it. That's <laughs> so how? How the key you... takeaway is I'm a bitch because I'm talking about it in quantitative terms. No, to just get around the fact that I didn't do the yeah, I didn't do my duty. I mean, I'm sure you could find another more cowbell around there, right? There's, I'm... yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, no, actually, no. So this was super awkward. I kind of went on. Uh, I believe the phrase is temper tantrum, uh-huh. but I had a temper tantrum last Wednesday when one of our board members texted in the middle of the day that uh, he got the last six pack of Crush City from our to go sale. And I was like, how the fuck is this possible? Like, <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm looking, sorry, by the way, that cough was not <laughs> a coronavirus. <laughs> that was, uh, that was a mixture of allergies and cannabis. Yeah. I just want to clarify <laughs> for all of you fucking judgmental people out there. It's fine. It's, fine. it's just the weed. So it's fine. Those are the good old fashioned things that have been going on for decades. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I know you know what I'm talking about, right? You're, yes. I'm trying to mind my own business. I got a mask on at H-E-B. I'm just looking at the tomatoes. I didn't mean to cough on them. Why am I in a fist fight all of a sudden? <laughs> People are on edge. Yes. So. Yeah, anyway. they, for sure. It's um, You do have to like, explain your coughs now, for sure. Right? Yeah. Right. It's allergies. It's fine. I'm on antibiotics for allergies. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, or whatever, right? It's like, uh, I don't know. It's like, the. it's weird, right? I don't know. So many things in society are fine, but now it's like, uh, you know, your cough is the one thing, the major faux pas. It's, it is what it is. People are on edge. People are scared. And, and, I, and the fears are 100% legitimate. Sure. And, every, and it's understandable. But then it's also pretty hard to remember that in the moment when you're just like, I just touched my face. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not bad. There's I had a, a booger in my nose, so I went after it. <laughs> yeah, I it's forgot. fine. It's just a booger. Uh, COVID, it's a dry cough. There's no boogers with COVID. Uh, yes. <laughs> there was a, I read a story the other day where uh, nicotine might actually help suppress the overreaction of people's uh, immune system because it's the, the cytokines, and this is way beyond what I know. Like I don't know if you have yeah. a medical uh, expert on staff there anywhere, Troy, maybe. Um, but it's... Uh, I don't know, like cigar smoking might be one of the best therapies you can do uh, for this thing. I don't know. Relaxation. Yeah, right. You know, you're not. Yeah, I've been, yeah, I've, I've been just buying snake oil by the gallon and just rubbing myself in them. Uh, holy water as well. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got a garlic they necklace. Stop that. Right. They stopped doing that. It's, it's to stop the spread. Now. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, can we just. I don't know which disinfectant. I'm on my way to H-E-B now. I just don't know which one to buy. Well, all I know is uh, Darwin Origin Species has a little something to say about anyone who listened to that press conference. I just, I can't wait for the first, the first article, you know, uh, MAGA fanatic, fanatic commits suicide by injecting disinfectant. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't suicide. It was lemming-like behavior. Yeah. It, <laughs> listen, that guy, you know, what, say what you will about your political stances and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, uh, that guy has spent more time in front of a camera in the last month than there's there's cam girls that aren't in front. He's like the ultimate <laughs> cam girl, right? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> otherwise known Those as girls are working overtime right now too. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise known as former bartenders. The ugly truth <laughs> about 22 million unemployed uh-huh. is there another 22 million that don't have jobs still that aren't getting in the unemployment line and some of them became strippers. Yeah. So how about that? Anyway, some of them are committing suicide because they've been in poverty for the first time. Some of them have uh, spousal abuse issues and domestic abuse issues and now I'm on my soapbox. 
about unintended consequences when leadership doesn't take the time to think about the frying pan, the fire, and what you want to be on. Yeah. But, um, anyways, my bad. I'm going to get back to my risky. Oh, which yeah. Tastes terrific at 10:30 a.m. <laughs> so, which which one was Especially it? Especially when you're looking death in the eyes. <laughs> This is the the Texas bourbon. It's one of his single barrel distillery only picks. Yeah, yeah. That, they're um, I don't know where they are. Like all of this probably puts a lot of things on hold. When he was on the show, um, gosh, I guess it was earlier. Was it earlier this year? Man, I don't even know. It could have been earlier this month. I have no idea. Could have uh, been yesterday, it, for God's sake. It could I don't have even been. know what I did this morning. Yeah, <laughs> it could have been all of that. But um, it. They were talking about, you know, they're looking for a new, a new location, uh, yeah. possible big, you know, and I don't know where they are and all of that, but, uh, man. They, they created a sanitizer business, so that kind of derailed them for a minute. So now that that thing's rocking and rolling, it, it sounds like they're looking to. Yeah. And they're giving this, they're giving the stuff away. They're, yeah. They're literally. Just, yeah. You can. In just, a really magnanimous way. Yeah. Like, you can, what did you say what they were doing with the hospitals? So, so Ryan went up and we, we, you know, we've been going around. Travis texted me real early. Ryan went up to say hi because I was sucking some bullshit that I couldn't couldn't do. And he went up and bought, bought a, well, we bought like 10 bottles. Oh, wait, that's not legal. We shouldn't have said that in writing. But, uh, yeah, he it, yeah, individually purchased each bottle on one-day transaction. Oh, whatever the fucking For stupid line. Yeah, we, we were like, hey, here's hundreds of dollars. We just want to get drunk and support our besties. Mm-hmm. So then you brought back a fucking haul. Which Troy's fucking team drank one of the bottles in two hours. <laughs> my, my team destroyed one Friday. Yeah, oops. Yeah, we, oh, we had a socially nice. distanced ask me anything sales team meeting mm-hmm. where this, you know, the whole team got to get around a table and really just dance around asking me if they were going to get laid off until they finally had enough whiskey to ask point blank. And then I finally had enough whiskey to say, not if I have anything to do with it, but yeah. I can't control the fucking world. Right. I can control these four walls. You got a job as long as I have a job. Actually, that's not true. Uh, Ryan, Troy, Alex, and I all stopped taking paychecks and took furloughs uh, on March 16th. So I guess a better way to put it is you have a job even though I don't have a job. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I yeah. think that's a brilliant idea, though. One, uh, I love the heart that that sh- – I mean, and I'm not just blowing smoke up your skirt. I think that's – there's a lot of – CEOs and, uh, you know, upper, you know, management and things like that. And all these companies, I know the company I work for, the executives have taken pay cuts or just yeah. quit taking, uh, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And it's, um, listen, I, you know, there's that, there's a narrative out there about the big, bad business owner and things like that. And it's, it, this does not, it doesn't jive with reality in most cases. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's anomalies everywhere in everything, right? You can yeah. find a boogeyman if you look hard enough anywhere, but as far as, as as far as I can see, the you know in this country and in, in the the best industries with you know especially beer that man it's, there's so much heart and so much love at the top uh, in these companies that the reason everybody got into these uh, this business in the first place right is absolutely it, it started with love and, and and went from there and uh, absolutely so God bless you guys for what y'all are doing and uh, thank you Josh uh, it's just you know it, I, I don't know. thank you brother yeah and 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 look I mean uh, not to not to kind of take a victory lap, but I think there are a lot of Johnny come lately's showing up on this one. And I just want to say, and you know, actually I just realized I got the present company as a perfect example. Like I, and maybe, you know, this, I, I don't know, but I don't know if other breweries are giving away free equity for sweat, but, but we give sweat equity. So like Troy has his sixth anniversary on May 1st and Ryan, you've been with me for nine years come June. And, uh, and uh, I gave Ryan equity on day one oh, man. that uh, that he didn't buy. Gave him just shares straight up. Said, "Hey, if you suffer through working with me, the incredible <laughs> shithead, for three fucking years, you deserve a halo uh, <laughs> and a retirement fund." You know. And then uh, Troy's Troy shares vested last anniversary, right? Yeah. Uh, after we had uh, given a three-year vesting on, I think, the second anniversary or something like that. So both of these guys have shares in the company that they didn't purchase, 100% vested, which makes them my boss. Uh, mm-hmm. So they actually get to vote if I get uh, if I'm if it's time when it's time to fire when it is time to fire Raz. Uh, Ryan and Troy get to vote on that one, you know. <laughs> 
know, so, it's going to be a long time before I'm done learning from you guys. Yeah, I know. I don't know about that. Yeah, at least uh, two or three more cowbells now at 10.45 a.m., right? <laughs> but, but I think the, gra- the greater point is um, <clears throat> I'm asking the team to go through a lot right now and to dig deep and to, to open up some reservoirs that we didn't really know that we had before this pandemic and to gel and to suspend some disbelief and to just kind of trust in my leadership for a little bit and to tighten the belt a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so if the family tightens the belt in the winter, then when it's summertime and when it's Thanksgiving time and there's food on the table, you better be sharing that bounty around too. So, uh, um, yeah, you know, we've got some furloughs in in certain ways, not really nothing in the core, but uh, besides the owners. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll double down on, on shares to, to, to uh, teammates who, who get us through this. Because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, Henry V style, like a uh, band of brothers, merry men, like saying, this is our St. Crispin's Day moment. Yeah. This is a battle where you're to my left and you're to my right and we made it through here. You're my brother. You're my, well, androgynous. You're on my team. And, and I don't know how the fuck we got through this, but we did, you know. You tell me just yesterday, adversity shows the true measure of a man. Yeah, adversity shows the measure of a man. Yeah, that's oh, true. The, well, when you speak to it, it the What's thing. That? That, well, when you speak to everything that you're just you're speaking to this this challenge that this uh, this country, the world is is facing currently, right? It, it's interesting that the Times uh, put forth a challenge that is uniquely um, needed for the generation at hand. I, I guess, and I, I maybe people just um, you know, this is not a, a war with like another it is. with well yeah. with like with another army right we don't we can't see we can't see the uh the enemy um it, you know we don't know the timeline of this like you can't draw out a battle plan uh to fight something that you don't know you know when it mutates on you like 30 different strains or something like that but i think our generation as far as you know we're we're, we're so used to uh, conquering things with technology and things like that we yeah. needed something that would test us on a level that um we we weren't completely prepared for yes you know what i'm saying and it's it's like um this, this is our crucible yeah this is our generation's opportunity to show up and say the great generation was defined by the great depression and the and the boomers made it happen mm-hmm. this is a millennial's crucible yes and you know the millennials get shit all the time right yeah and sometimes you know Sometimes deservedly so, but sometimes it's just kind of like, oh, that's just the joke we go to every time, right? Just because. My my millennials work so fucking hard for me because we take the time as leaders to explain the why. Mm -hmm. And I think that that millennials were born a little bit with more access to information. Mm -hmm. I know when I grew up, my, my mom... You know, we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we, we had an we had the encyclopedia set, Funk and Wagner's, <laughs> yeah. that you bought by the letter. So it's like when we had three dollars more, we bought the 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 F, and then <laughs> we had we went to the grocery store. Do you remember this? I don't know. Yeah, we had to... make me. She'd make me look shit up, uh-huh. you know. And so we know how to look things up. So when you tell me X Y Z, and then the CDC tells me A B C, mm-hmm. I know how to look that up. Yes. I know how to tell the difference, and so does ever the rest of our generation. And so then, when I put my marketing hat on, and I'm talking to your your group, that's what I love about you know that's what I love about your your listener group that's listening right now. Y'all are smart as fuck. You got we make better beer because we have better drinkers now who prefer better beer, and they know authenticity. They can look shit up. We grew up with the internet at our disposal. If you say something out of one side of your mouth and then go into a different room and say something else, if you hide this point, if you say it's all natural but there's an asterisk, people know. Mm-hmm. They look it up. Yeah. And and it's a great uh, it's a great time of accountability. Yeah, but, it's man, it obviously, you know, when people when we get past this and in years past, a decade past, we'll be able to look back on it and kind of analyze what went on. But it's a it's a it's a challenge that you really have to take a marathon approach to. I mean, it's been how much six weeks now, and we still don't know really much more than than we did when we first started. Other than okay, it's not gonna it's not gonna jump out of the bushes and grab you and, and kill you like a bear, 
Unless yeah. it's like a bear with with uh, the virus, which is the scariest thing. Yeah. A, a bear with the virus and an, like a like an AR-15 would be the scariest thing right now. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you know, luckily there's not. There's very few. I'm going to caveat. There's very few of those running around right yeah. now. So, uh, but it's one of those things. Like it, it does take kind of a, a measured approach. Uh, you know, wait and see. Don't rush in. Uh, and it's like everything we, we were like the whole generation has been prepared for that. It's like, let's just see how things play. I don't know. It, to me, it's like I'm kind of seeing these little moments of epiphany where it's like, all right, don't judge everything right here at the moment. The 24 hour news cycle and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Just, yeah, you know, that, that's interesting. That's a really good point, too. And, and uh, OK, so I'm, I'm a, maybe a two minute tangent, but is it okay if I get super fucking nerdy? Please on on the consumer experience of, not, of coronavirus. Not only is it okay, it's it's uh, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm so in the this. 1970s, a literary critic broke down semiotics, right? Jacques, Jacques Derrida and Jean Baudrillard. Jean Baudrillard is one of my favorite French philosophers from the 70s, and he wrote an article or a book called Simulation in the Simulacra, where he talked about I say the word chair. And it means something in my head. And then you point to a physical chair and it's different than what was in your head when I said the word chair. Then you put it up on a TV screen and it's different than the actual physical chair. And then you start talking about what you saw on the TV screen and it's different completely. It's like a game of tel telephone as it relates to your senses. So it's called, you know, so you've got the signifier, the signified, the simulation and the simulacra. So... Uh, Jean Baudrillard's philosophical works were made into the Matrix by the Wachowski brothers. So you can see basically what the Wachowski brothers and what Baudrillard was saying was language sits as a system of objects disconnected from reality that is almost like the Matrix. You take a pill to go into an alternate reality created by language. Now enter television. Language is an obfuscated another layer to be the simulacra rather than the signified and the simulation and this idea of uh, uh, of a thing that happened in reality in front of you is now on a television screen. It's another level of disconnection. So Jean Baudrillard in 1991, this is what I'm getting to, I promise it is worth your time. He wrote a book called The Iraq War Did Not Exist. So why, didn't, why does he say the Iraq War did not exist? We saw caskets on TV. We saw things happen overseas. We saw images on television screens. We read about it in news articles. Some of us heard it secondhand from our friends who actually served. You know, but our generation, to speak to your point that launched this whole concept, our generation hasn't been tested, and it hasn't felt a real portion, a, a real visceral feeling of tangible adversity on our shores since 9-11. And even then, 9-11, for me, was, ex was, was experienced with the cognitive dissonance of, I see the most horrible tragedy on television. I go outside of my dorm room because was, I was a sophomore and I know exactly where I was. I was in the hex. I slept in a little bit. I was going to American literature with, with Dr. Aranda. And, 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 and it's a beautiful day out. The sun is shining and you're like, what the fuck is going on? I see something on TV and I experience something viscerally. So right now, coronavirus, everyone's playing follow the leader with everyone telling us, hey, you should do this. You should do that. And we are agreeing. But we haven't viscerally witnessed or experienced this virus yet. Do you know someone who's had it? I don't know a single person who's had it directly. So we are all playing following the leader. So the consumer demand is going to turn on two fulcrums. First is people know someone who got sick. And second, people know someone who died. And I would just point out that we probably have another God knows how many deaths in between now and this thing being over. Yeah. And it's going to get really real and really visceral for the first time in our entire lives, even 9-11 and the Iraq War were experienced through a lens that was disconnected and non-visceral. It's not a phenomenological experience. Okay, I'm done with that. Uh, no, I'm back to my cowbell and whiskey. I'm sorry about that. But no, uh, it was, I hope that wasn't too much of a, a long, long spiel. But that, no. those are the things that we're thinking about. You know, you no, know, that's that's so true. It's um, you, it's you could not have hit the nail more on the head. Um, it just for the first time in a what two generations i guess i mean yeah i mean it's been seeing things on tv 
and, and then on the internet, YouTube, you know, that sort of thing. And, it's a meme now. Yes. Oh, I made a meme about this stupid thing. Yeah. 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 yeah that's I, I was joking the other day. It's like when my great grandkids asked me, you know, Grampy Josh, how did you make it through the, the pandemic? All oh, the memes. We made it was all, all the memes. memes. <laughs> it, was, it was all the memes that kept us kept us going. And it's like, because there's memes every day. There's some new meme about, you know, something. But it's like, you know, yeah, thing, you know, shit's about to get real. And, uh, like, really real. Not like, uh, you know, yeah, Harris County has, uh, we have to wear a mask for 30 days or something like that. I mean. Or pay a thousand bucks. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's it's crazy, right? You know, I was thinking, as far as marketing. And, and, and just to be crystal clear about that leadership decision, uh-huh. we required, so the CDC required masks on a Monday. We've required mass of our employees that Tuesday. Uh-huh. And, and basically, the reason being is we took the prevailing logic of, A, I am not an epidemiologist. So if I am going to choose one source of truth that I trust, mm-hmm. and you got to believe in something. Mm-hmm. Some institution is valuable. you got to trust someone. And when the CDC said that the best way for me to protect my employees' health was to ask them to wear masks, I said, hey, guys. I told you before the CDC said no mass. Now they're saying mass. Before I said no mass. Now I'd say mass. Like I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm yeah. just trusting the experts here. So if if the if Harris County's judge was internally consistent, she would have listened to the CDC then and said it then. Also, a thousand dollar fine for anyone who's not wearing a mask. Come the fuck on. Yeah. My people don't have a thousand dollars because you fucking shut us down. You fucking now this is why uh, this you're gonna see masks. you're gonna see the reason why my employees have a kickball team called the wrath of raz because this is when i come fucking unhinged yeah you can't tell my people that they have to not ha- take a paycheck and then at the other side of your mask mouth say they have to wear a mask or they have a thousand dollar fine yeah is come that, on, man. yeah is that With 24 maybe, hours notice come on yeah man. maybe that's the reason for the mask so we can't see them speaking out of both yes. sides of their mouth how about we, we hear take it? our asperger's at head out of our fucking ass think about another human being for a goddamn second imagine what the front what the frontline team has to deal with on a daily basis and have some goddamn compassion and patience yeah. for good people who are just trying to do it the right way. Yeah. I, all I want to do is protect my people and protect my guests. I'm looking for someone to tell me how to do that. Yeah. Anyways, I'm well, on diatribes now. No, it's listen, I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. And if they had wanted to be more effective, it, to me, it almost, it plays like a petty tyrant power play type thing. It's like if you want more people to wear masks, say this is what we recommend. And instead of taking a thousand dollars from somebody, here's a thousand dollars out of the pocket of we all threw in everybody here at the yeah. uh, the county offices. Thousand dollars to the best decorated, blinged out mask that we right? see out there. We're gonna give petty cash to our you know officers yes. out walking around. Ooh, dude, make here's it a th- fun. Yes. You know, Are you watching the hundred humans on Netflix? The 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 Pasta Tower episode is a great example of what happens. <laughs> When you motivate people with money versus fun and you read the book Drive by Daniel Pink Mm -hmm. and he shows you and and he lays out this great experiment where he's talking about, um, excuse me, uh, artists, visual artists who painted a painting of their own volition versus a a commission based art. art. And uh, you see compliance when you make things fun. Mm -hmm. You see you see compliance when you make things monetary based or punitive, but you see like real excitement and the best things happen when you make it fun and you don't get boundaries and you don't you have a light touch on the sandbox. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The greater point is there's a lack of intellectual leadership at every level mm-hmm. of government on both sides of the aisle. That's why this is not a political rant. This is a, a, a business owner just saying, hey, guys, all I want to do, the number one thing I want to do is make sure that my team is healthy and safe. And then when we open back up, I need to make sure that my team has a ba- has an ability to pay rent. Like, I don't know if you know this, but May 1st, they have to pay rent again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then on June 1st, they're going to have to pay rent again. And yep. we got to make we got to make it possible for our people to pay rent. And they can't do that with this drive through bullshit. And then you're going to open up and we're going to open up into a climate where OSHA isn't giving me clear direction on how do I protect my employees. The youth and health department made me throw away ribeyes that we cryovac 
even though we removed the oxygen because they thought we were going to try and sous vide them for weeks from now. We're, we're like, if we, it, it's just the, the laws don't make sense or rel, the regulations don't make sense. And the intellectual burden is being pushed from a uh, government who has the resources to run science down to people at the business level. So now when you come over here as a guest in hopefully early to mid-May, certainly no later than June or July, right? But as you come as a guest, who has the most influence over your personal health and safety? I would like it to be OSHA. I would like it to be the Houston Health Department. I would like it to be the CDC or the FDA. I would like it to be these NGOs or these government organizations who have resources and access to information that can tell us this is the best practice for how to do it. But the reality is, is I'm going to get together with my management team. I'm going to talk to our, 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 uh, our colleagues. I'm going to figure out what other private enterprise is doing. And we're going to lead because we are leaders, because we have integrity, because we care about the health and safety of our guests and our employees. And we're going to lead with more concrete policies than any of these mouth breathing, lying pieces of shit that we voted for or didn't vote for could fucking muster on a motherfucking Monday, let alone every goddamn day of the week. I'm off my soapbox. Whitmire's whiskey is fantastic <laughs> at all hours of the day. Yes. From 10 a.m. to 10:59. Yes. Here it goes. Uh, <laughs> it's. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm no. Sure. I hope that was helpful. No, I, this is. That's, uh, that's how this business owner is thinking about the pandemic. Listen, it's it's absolutely needed, and that's one of the things where you know on this podcast, you know, you've been on a handful of times, and you know, we talk beer a lot, and I love talking beer. And, uh, you know, nerding out about it and, and hop, you know, additions and hop variations and yeast, vary, all that kind of stuff. But, man, you know, when life, you know, it, the conversations go where life leads them, right? I think this whole thing exposes so many, you know, people, politicians and people in leadership. You know, that's one place people are getting exposed. The media, people are getting exposed, you know, like the big corporate media and things like that. that they just don't, you know... What what are they actually providing and giving at this point? And it's not a lot. It's not a it's lot. It's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. It, they they increase uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically, there, it, it's like as soon as we have some certainty from a scientist who says, hey, uh, you know, masks aren't perfect, but they can keep your little COVID particles up on your face. Mm -hmm. You may be asymptomatic. You could be. If 20% or 80% of our population is asymptomatic, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Put a mask in front of their face. They can stop a handful of particles. It's not perfect, but it's something. Yeah. And, and, and just bill it like that. Mm -hmm. And back to millennials and the population, our IQ is higher. Our access to information is higher. We have evolved as a society over the last 300 years, don't bring us back to the dark ages, what transparency and, gov and authority-based government was described as the dark ages, literally, yep. right? Just get the information out there. Let us fact check. Let us have the, the story. Get out there and say, hey, we don't know everything because no one knows everything. God knows everything, right? right? You know, maybe he does. Maybe he's even like, I don't know, devil made this one. We're still catching up to Satan and figuring out what the fuck he did on this one, right? I mean, we watch <laughs> Avengers, Thor chasing Loki. It takes a while to figure out what the fuck he's thinking. Maybe God doesn't even know how to solve this shit right now. I don't know. It's okay for a leader to say, we've got a lot of uncertainty and we are chartering the path that we believe right now is the safest path forward. We're taking all the information at our disposal. We're taking this seriously. We're looking, we're looking, we're learning. And this is our best hypothesis for today. And guess what? Tomorrow, it might be different. Yeah. But we're, but we're doing the best we can. We're taking it seriously. And, 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 and we're looking to provide, you yeah. know? Well, and that's been, that's been working internally. I'm really lucky. My team, my team's smarter. Uh, and I, 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 I didn't mean that in like a zero-sum competitive way. I just mean like... I'm so proud of how phenomenal my team is. They're mature. They get it. Top to bottom, left to right. The whole organization is listening to me, you know, or not listening to me. But I'm like, look, guys, I don't know everything, but I'm going to fight like a motherfucker until my last dying breath. And we're going to do this the right way. 
one foot in front of the other gets us out of this shit. I just don't know exactly how fast. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And nobody, and that's the thing. Nobody knows. And the best you can do is uh, do what you can when you can, when the opportunity presents itself. And then, you know, get, grab a beer and go by and get some, maybe some of that pizza. I was looking at y'all's, uh, the pictures y'all posted the other day, some of that pizza, your burgers or something to go. Yeah. Ah. Oh. oh, man. Can we just. Have, uh, I, oh. have I told you about the pepperoni pizza we're making, by the way? Please, please go on. Okay, by the way, and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to unmitigate it, Brad. In the middle of all this, uh-huh. two things are really cool that I want to tell you about that I'm really proud of. And I had nothing to do with either of these. This is all, all chef. Uh, but thing number one, we're starting to produce these meals for hospi- hospitals. And, uh, and it's all through NextSeed. NextSeed has done a magnificent job. They set up a fund we're about to go live with where you can, you can donate $100. And then we're taking our full price menu and we're delivering $10 box meals to frontline healthcare employees. So I delivered with, with Chef 50 meals on Sunday. Faust Distributing, who I, I, I can't say enough great things about Don Faust Jr., the whole team over there, uh, uh, about everyone, uh, Dave Gillette over there, the, they bought like, they donated $500 and we delivered 50 box meals that are, you know, I would charge you $16 for the meal and, and, and we give it to them for 10 so, so those are some really cool things that are happening. Now, we're doing that also with first responders. So the Houston Police Officers Union, they came in, and we had, to, we had to do a couple of tricks. You know, we had to prove out how safe our kitchen is and all the extensive measures that we're doing above and beyond the Houston Health Department's requirements and the baseline legal requirements. We are way above those standards. And, uh, and now we've got a contactless pickup process for first responders where they're getting an egregiously d- deep discount. Uh, they're basically paying for my food costs and my labor costs. I'm not making money and my landlords aren't making money off of the deal. But, uh, but, my, but the, the line cook who made the burger and the uh, front of house guy who ran into the car uh, is getting paid a uh, full salary. So that's kind of how we're, we're thinking about profit in the age of coronavirus yeah. and the uh, moral responsibility of not, you know, as I like to say, you know, pigs get fat and hogs go to slaughter. So don't be a fucking pig in the first place, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, that's how we're thinking about all that. But the second thing that I wanted to brag about was uh, that uh, the Houston Health Department did run a little sting in the middle of all this, and we got a perfect score on our, on our um, health, health code. Uh, our first uh, surprise inspection. So, so that's, and that really means a lot to me because it's like we're doing everything we can in the absence of leadership at the elected level. We're doing everything we can to control our own, what, what happens in our own four walls, you know, like I like to tell my team, like you can't control what so-and-so is doing, but you can control your two hands or your two lips. So fucking get them under control, bro. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and don't complain about the other person if your shit's not tight yourself, yeah. you know? So, anyways, yeah. I'm rambling. No. Specs and logs in your eyes and things like that. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So. Gentlemen, I'm out. Ah. Love you all. Happy Have vacation. Yeah, Troy. Keep keep safe, brother. Pleasure. Cheers, y'all. It's good to see you, bud. Russell, you got good people, man. What's that? You've got good people. Yeah, I don't know how either. I'm just lucky as fuck. It's yeah. just that simple. But yeah, Troy actually, he's coming up on his sixth anniversary on May 1st. That's wild. So, uh, yeah. Oh, he's left the room, so we don't know that. He doesn't know this yet, but Stephanie got me this great, his wife got me this great picture uh-huh. of him, like, looking creepy as fuck, sitting on an Easter bunny's lap. <laughs> and so I, I held on to that for Easter because, you know, it just didn't seem like the right time. Uh-huh. But I'm going to carpet bomb that motherfucker on his anniversary. <laughs> just public embarrassment in front of the whole team. It's going to be great. Nice. Uh, well, yeah. Well, as, wow. a, as a kid? Yeah. Yeah. That's... it's Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's too good. He's got like... Oh, man, it's too good. So, yeah, that's how we do it here. You know, we... Uh, Build everyone up during the business day, and then when it's time to talk shit, well, <laughs> comes kind of crashing down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on all the beers available uh, in for to go purposes. Hey, and also, do you think 
Do you think at any point during this that you'll be able to deliver should you show, so decide to individuals like legally and all that kind of stuff? I know pe- some people are doing some that, but do you think okay. that'll... So, look, here's... I, I have the giant caveat of the century before I answer that question okay. as Rasul the individual, okay. right? Right. So the giant caveat of the century is that I deeply respect everything that the Texas Craft Brewers Guild is doing, uh-huh. and they do phenomenal work. In fact, I would actually also say that the coronavirus updates, the only group that I have told, the only groups that I've told my teams to, to, to look at is go to the CDC website, go to the Texas Craft Brewers Guild Coronavirus Resources Guide, and those are the only two groups that are sanctioned where they've got my rubber stamp where I'm like, if Charles over at the Texas craft brewers guild has posted it to the website, then it's good news, you know, and I'm not trying to roll around with a, with a moniker of fake news. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm saying there's a lot of dodgy information flowing around injecting sanitizer through your veins. That's fucking dumb. Right. Mm -hmm. Good thing. Our president didn't say that during a press conference, you know, but anyways, like there's a lot of misinformation flying around. So look at the CDC, look at the Texas craft brewers guild that said, get into a time machine two years ago. And I said, beer to go. What's not worth torching personal relationships. So I refused to produce any social media supporting because I thought that the rhetoric around that movement was fucking poison. And sure enough, it was. Everyone was talking about distributors as if they're like the adversary. My two distrib- my four distributors, but my two in particular here in my sandbox are the only reason I'm alive. Mm-hmm. Don Faust Jr. and Bo Huggins have both called me up. Owners of Faust and, and HG have both called me up at various times and deeply personal levels saying, hey, guy, like when I was your age and I was going through this challenge, this was keeping me up at night. And, and, and I have not had personal mentors uh, who understood my business quite on the same level that the two of them have had and or have been and 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 throughout this whole pandemic you know you know Don Faust Jr. comes here himself and buys a a meal for his family that I know took a couple times for him to uh, he had a lot a couple of levels of leftovers and then he he buys our food and pays my staff to deliver to, to hospitals, that, that's the caliber of human being that these guys are. Mm-hmm. And during the beer to go process, people were getting the wrong side of the rhetoric talking about distributors as if they're assholes and as if it's an adversarial relationship. It's not. It, these are our customers, and I only exist because of them. I only exist because of you. I exist because of our listeners. I be, exist because of them. I exist because of, of uh, everyone who comes here. I don't look a gift horse in the mouth, and you have to understand that all. So right now, we're seeing exactly what we did with Beer to Go, which is over-entrenching on an, an idea that is pennies, not dollars. Mm-hmm. What the fuck am I going to do? Deliver a, an eight dollar six pack three miles with thirty minutes notice, and if someone doesn't get it in fifteen minutes, they're upset and write a, a one star Yelp review for my overall business because I didn't deliver on Uber Eats standards. Well, news alert, uh, news flash: Uber Eats is not profitable. They're taking thirty points. So this is what these motherfuckers are doing. They are price fixing contracts. To where I can't charge a different price to you at home through Uber Eats versus you at home or you showing up in my driveway. I'm not legally allowed to charge different prices even though there is obviously a different cost structure and the consumer understands. I'll pay $20 for a pizza that lands on my doorstep in a contactless way. I'll pay $16 for a pepperoni pizza that I have to drive to pick up. Everyone understands this value proposition. That's good competitive theory, right? Well, these motherfuckers say you have to have the same price to me as in your dining room, and then they take 30 points from me and charge you a delivery fee. They're double dipping, and they're still not profitable because they're paying their executives exorbitant fees and they're paying their drivers fucking peanuts like the drivers are wrong side up 
after you factor gas and the depreciation on the vehicle that they had to buy new to keep to the cleanliness standards of Uber Eats. This is corporate hegemony. These are the fucking wolves in sheep clothing that are bleeding our organization dry. The right to d- deliver feels like a, a false sense. And, and you got to remember, Josh, I self-distributed. I personally delivered every keg off the back of my pickup truck for the first six months while Ryan was the only other employee of this organization. He put every keg into the cold box, and then he had that shitty fucking smile that he always has that you might have seen (laughs) when he passed a Whitmire's bottle to me, Uh where he's like, he gets this wry fucking smile where he's like, tag, you're it. And I'm like, fuck you, man. Like, I just emptied, I emptied it yesterday, and now I have to deliver how many more kegs? That's fine. So I fucking delivered these kegs with 24 hours notice, doing 75 in- invoices overnight, running. We, we did, I think we did like, we did some egregious amount. Of, I think we did like 20 grand in one day across three different routes when we released Gingerbread in 2015. I mean, I made I shouldn't be bragging. I'm on the other side of, of Whitmire's, but we made more than $900,000 in revenues off our self-distribution arm annualized. Well, you know, years before we signed over our distribution rights. So we had a, we had a, what is that? Seven, I'm, I'm out of fingers. We had a seven figure delivery subsidiary uh-huh. years ago. And I've got no fucking appetite delivering $8 six packs to people who will judge us against Uber Eats, who's fucking unprofitable anyway. Yeah. So uh, that's how I feel. That's my opinion, and we welcome yours. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there should be an infographic. Da 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 da. The more you know. Yeah. I don't... No, listen. That's I'm. I'm. You know, I, I was really looking forward to talking to you, but and this is you know part of it was just catching up and seeing my friends, but. The, the other yeah. side is you, you always, you know, uh, you offer the, uh, a business side that I, I don't always get to see. And as a, a consumer and, and somebody who just yeah. kind of, you know, views things from a, you know, bird's eye view, you're like, oh, well, they should do that. And they're like, wait a minute. Well, maybe there's a reason that, that it's not happening if I would take two seconds. But well, when, when I, I think that, to- yeah, look, HEB acquired favor. They know how to do it. Mm-hmm. HEB is putting on a master class on how to be a retailer. You know, uh, Troy and I were emailing Justin Cody uh, over at Specs, and, 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 and he's so responsive, and he's so on top of his game, and Specs knows how to do this. Let them do it. Yeah. Understand when you're good at something and when you're not good at something, yeah. and when you need other people in the ecosystem to be better at something and work within that ecosystem. If you're Shaq, don't throw free throws. <laughs> if you're Jordan... Pass to Steve Kerr so that he can shoot the three the three pointer. Mm-hmm. If you're Harden, uh, yeah, run sixty points and lose the finals. I don't know, <laughs> but the, the the greater point is this is a team game mm-hmm. with an ecosystem that's bigger than just Buffalo Bayou, and we've got a lot of great people out there. We've got partnerships with phenomenal organizations that are best in class. Like we've got the best fucking distributors in the goddamn world with H E and Faust. It's that simple. They're jamming it. They're getting it going. Trust the system yeah. to make it happen. Don't try and get 75 cents. Don't spend $3 in time to get 75 cents in gross margin when the reality is that you're just accelerating going out of business mm. because you don't know how to deliver. That's so true. Don't. That's, yeah, yeah. Stay, uh, you know, we're, I, I love our pizza. But at home, I am ordering Star Pizza delivery. And, I, and at work, I am not asking my front of house people to be pizza delivery people. Mm-hmm. Because Star Pizza makes my favorite pizza in Houston even better than Arash. Don't tell them I said that. This isn't being recorded, right? So we're fine. <laughs> right. Anyway, Star Pizza is my fucking favorite for goddamn 20 goddamn years since... The, the first week at Rice when I landed here as a freshman, I fucking love Star Pizza. They're one of our, what, like the first 10? They're first kegs. Yeah. Yeah, good luck getting that beer off tap, right? Like, pry that from my dead fucking hands. I love Star Pizza. And, and Hank and Michael make, and Danny will make sure it doesn't go anywhere. But the greater point is, like, 
I don't know how to deliver pizza. So when we talked about should we have a delivery service for our food, I said, no, let's start pizza, deliver their pizzas. If, pop, if people want our pizza, we'll pick them, they'll, they'll come and pick it up. But um, it's not zero sum, it's not that competitive. I don't think about it in those terms, but I do think about it as what are you good at and what can you do well? Yeah. I can't get beer to the ultimate consumer better than anyone else unless you come here to have it in my patio. That's it. So I'm not gonna try and, try and change that. Mm-hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna work the system and, 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 and thank my partners for being good at what they do. So, yeah, I think, I, so to, to just like get further on the soapbox, make it twice as high and just really entrench in my opinion. Uh, also, I like to say uh, management uh, opinion should be uh, strong opinions loosely held. So uh, be strong. And then as soon as you have new information, get the fuck off your point. There's no ego in it. We just want to do right by our team and our customers. That's it. But if I were to just entrench in a single, like Raz said this and he's an asshole for being black and white, I would just say you don't have money to make in your delivery services. If you think you do, it's because you're not running the financial model right. You are not actually quantifying your non-cash costs and you will grow yourself broke if you actually take this model all the way to fruition. Trust the three-tier system. Trust your retailers to be good at being retailers. Don't pretend you're a fucking retailer because you're not. Look at Apple. When Apple wanted to release an iPhone, Best Buy said, hey, we're pretty good at releasing iPhones as well. And even though Apple had an exclusive route to market with a retail tier, they still allow all releases to go through Best Buy because the number one technology company on the fucking planet still knows they're a technology company, not a goddamn retailer. Don't pretend that you fucking are. You don't know how to be dominoes. Don't compete against them. Full stop. So if other breweries want to get access to those revenue flows, I'm not in their way. But don't waste political capital and don't talk shit about our distributors in the process. They are hardworking people who are showing up at 5 a.m. facing this virus right in the fucking eyes and delivering me a 70% year-over-year can pop. They're going to places that I personally don't want to go myself. They're doing the dirty work. They've got fucking dirt and coronavirus all up in their fingernails while they're building displays trying to keep normalcy happening. Shut the fuck up and respect that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's all I have to say. Oh, man. I'm, I'm glad you said that. It's, uh, it's one of those things when you walk into that one HEB doing a killer job at two, when you look at that display that wasn't put there by, you know, the beer fairy. It was put It there. didn't happen. It didn't just get teleported. This ain't Star Trek, motherfucker. Some brave person getting paid a wage that is not what anyone wants them to make, but that's economics of price wars, and that's the industry that we're in. By the way, if you are buying the dollar twenty-five pints of Carbach Hopadillo that they meant to sell in Minute Maid, but then dumped in the off-premise channel to accelerate the price war and just fuck it up, you're part of the problem too. Mm. Because $2 pints of cowbell is the right price. A dollar pint of hopadillo, just because they have to hit some corporate guideline to hit some uh, dividend earnings guideline that they cut for Wall Street. And I'm sorry your share price is in the shitter. And I'm sorry that Bush Gardens can't have people there and so now you have to sell Hopadillo to subsidize the corporate welfare of Carlos Brito. By the way, is Carlos Brito not taking a paycheck? That'd be interesting because yeah. in no uncertain terms, Carlos Brito is a fucking CEO of Carbach. And don't look me in the eye and tell me anything other than that. Right? Right. So when they bring the price war to get the volume so that Silver Eagle can be close to 20% down on the year, don't fall for that shit. Invest in quality, invest in loyal or in lo- local, loyal and local, different only by a single letter. <laughs> and uh, keep jobs in Texas. Don't send money to Belgium and New York City. Yeah, amen. Um, God damn it. This is what happens when I double fist cowbell and whiskey. You got the whole <laughs> truth, Josh. You got it all, man. <laughs> yeah, I would expect uh, no less. So, uh, yeah, right. It, <laughs> 
you do speak a lot. Of, you speak so much truth with everything you've said, and it's one of those things we need to hear. You know, all of that, the perspective, all of that, uh, all the time, because we, you know, we sit here and kind of keep our faces into Facebook and, and you know, I don't know, our distractions through Netflix. What sh- what was that show you said with the that you asked if I was watching with the the show on Netflix that you mentioned? What's that? Oh, 100 Humans. 100 Humans. So, okay. So the real thing is Danny Kahneman is, uh, Danny Kahneman uh, got a Nobel Prize in Behavioral Economics, and he wrote the book Thinking Fast and Thinking Snow. Uh, slow. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit buzz. Oops. Uh, <laughs> thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And then um, um, I think it was Michael Lewis actually wrote the, the synopsis of that excuse me, that book, which was uh, The Undoing Project, which was Danny Kahneman and um, ah, I forget his, his partner's name, who's in Israel, he was an economist. But anyway, this is an incredible book. And what they're doing is they're looking at uh, behavioral economics and looking at understanding how consumers think in different ways. So, for instance, if I were to write the following sentence, um, how many animals did... How many animals did Moses bring on his ark? If I were to write that sentence in a messy font versus a clean font, you would have a different answer. If it's in a messy font, you would slow down and realize that Noah had an ark, not Moses, and therefore Moses had zero people on the ark. But if the font were cleaner and you moved faster, it would key into a loop that cuts corners. Uh, Danny Kahneman describes it as loop one, loop two, a loop that cuts corners and therefore you would say to animals, which would be wrong because it's Noah, not Moses. But the vowel sounds and the syllables of two, o, uh, o, is right, yeah. that speeds up when the font is easy to read. It slows down with a font it's harder to read and you accurately engage a problem at hand and think more cognitively and you're more engaged. So 100 Humans is a popcorn Netflix version of behavioral economics, but Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow by uh, Danny Kahneman, the Nobel laureate, is uh, fucking dense as fuck. Oh my God, I read 10 pages and spent three hours thinking about those 10 pages and the implications for my business, that's a fucking book to read. The real book to read going into this epidemic pandemic is uh, Great by Choice by Jim Collins. So uh, if you really want to know the panacea, the panacea is productive paranoia. So the way the way he describes the uh, the uh, Bill Gates as a doomsday agent and like Dr. Doom and, you know, C. Ballmer became Dr. Dr. Doom. Uh That's that's a corporate book to understand how do we prepare three moves in advance for what's going to fuck us out of nowhere that we can't see coming hmm. anyways more platitudes no <laughs> and, a, and a good reading list i've got a, yeah. uh, have got good to great on my shelf right over here so was that good to great that's collins too i believe i fucking love that book yeah it's, that's my favorite book my second favorite book is uh saying the table by danny meyer and i just reread it for the like fifth time two days ago. I fucking love these books. They're great books. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, anything else we need to touch on before we, before we wrap and I let you, uh, did we talk about beer? We did a bit. We talked about great white Buffalo. We talked about more. Yeah, there we go. Well, well, what do we, uh, uh, no, I just felt bad that I hijacked it with all this nerdy shit. No, I wasn't too much of a dick. No, I love it. I, Listen, if I would do this show every day if I could, you know, with the variety well, yeah, of what we're talking about. So I hope you, I hope the listeners appreciate it as well. I, I you know, I, I wouldn't have gotten so nerdy if I didn't have such a deep respect for your listenership and understanding. Like, y'all want to know the real deal. You want to know, like, this is a human talking like a human, more good than bad, or maybe more bad than good. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out later. I'm sure everyone will second guess it, but. Just want to let you know the sprawling ideas coming out of our head. No, it's all good. And now it's recorded for history. I've been looking at these. Fuck, damn. <laughs> I've been looking at these episodes. This is you know audio history. John Holler helped me understand that. It's like it's real time audio history of the people in it going through it. And talk about a man 
whose anus produces sunshine. Again, man, I fucking love Holler Brewing. I love everything they're doing. And I love uh, John. John, he he gets it. Talk about it. He's smarter than I am. He's fucking, he's on this goddamn game. So that's what I love about, we're we're calling it the brewery district, hashtag brewery district. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so, you know, Ryan, Ryan will talk forever about Dave Omer and over at Urban South that, Fucking love that good man, people. and yeah, well, good people, great people, and then platypus, yeah, they're good people. I've, I've, every time I drive over there, they're they got the they got the door up and they're gunning. When you see the owner of the company in t shirt and shorts, sweating their fucking ass off, Cern and Ashton, that's a real fucking deal, y'all. This is what this shit is about. Yeah, that's what it's about. You know. And, like, I saw that when I was driving by Platypus on my ride home because it's, like, it's just right there. And I fucking love these guys. So yeah. I'm so proud of our the brewery district and what the team is doing here. Yeah, it's, man, it, it's good stuff. It just, um, I look at the landscape of Houston and greater Houston craft beer and then these little pockets that are kind of, you know, building up uh, in these little sections of, you know, the sections of Houston now. Yeah. And uh, that, if you call it, you know, if we want to, is that, are we now calling this the Brewers District? Is that? I, I, if you <laughs> called it, then I'm going to say that you called it. I mean, it should be. Yeah. We well, got, how far we got does it reach? four breweries and a cidery within walking distance. Yeah. Also a total wine if you want to get a Uber on the ride home with whatever else you want, you yeah. know. And we, um, you know, uh, I would hate to say anything uh, too premature, but there may be a collaborative distillery on the block around Summer Street. I don't know. What? I, what? <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm not drunk at 10 a, 11 a.m. <laughs> so anyways, uh, greater point is, yeah, fuck yeah, we're calling it the brewery district. Why not? I don't know. Is I, there another place that has better breweries in one place? Mm, uh, I don't know. Better? I don't know. No, I wouldn't say that. I would. Um, I'm just my curiosity goes to. All right, what is the definition of district? What is the you know the geographical so, terms? Yeah, listen. So I would say heterogeneity and walkability. So oh. for instance, you know, like if you were to say, "Hey, when's your when's your hazy IPA coming out?" I would be like. The second we can do something that sits next to Dave Omer, who's two blocks away. Yeah. Like Dave fucking wrote. I mean, is, is there is there someone who did hazy IPAs better than Dave Omer and or before him? Before him. When when he was at when he was at Whole Foods. Yeah. And then he was at uh, he was at uh, B fifty two. It's and you know and, and I love Spindle Tap. I certainly don't want to say anything negative of Spindle Tap. Uh, and I'm going to full disclosure while Ryan is literally to my right to tell you how we think about things. And I don't, uh, I love this man, but I don't want this to sound like I'm talking any shit about him. But, uh, remember, do you remember when we were trying to take a shot on goal with a hazy IPA and we did a, a double blind taste test every Friday, three or 4 PM. We do double blind taste tests where Troy and Jack sit in for me if I can't be there because their, their pilots are better than mine. And we looked at other people in a double blind way. Like Lighten Up, I had Love Street in the panel. And the early version of Lighten Up, Lighten Up's our four six Blondale that yeah. we just released. Our early version, I scored Love Street blind. This is painful for me of all fucking people on the goddamn fucking planet to say. But in a double blind taste test, I scored Love Street over Fireman's Four and Southern Star Blondale and the first test batch of Lighten Up produced by the man to my right who I fucking love more than Sunshine. Well, not more than Sunshine, now that vitamin D may cure coronavirus. Anyways, but the greater point <laughs> is like double blind. And that was me, that was us putting our money where our mouth is, which is like if you can't pick your beer over other people's beer, not knowing which is which. Mm-hmm. Don't fucking ask anyone else to, you know? So we didn't release Lighten Up until we consistently double blind, ranked it number one over a competitive set, including Love Street and others, you know? Yeah. And so now, double blind, I picked this over everyone else. It's that, it's that simple. 
and that's how we know it's ready. And 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 that's how we that's how we think about beers that we bring to market. And so, um, you know, when we brought, you know, we wanted to get a hazy IPA in, and I I put the kibosh on hazy IPAs until we were able to sell beer to go. I said, I do not want the quality. We don't get to control the time factor of quality on liquid that makes it into the market. So if we can't control that, then an hazy IPA degrade on day five Mm -hmm. off a fucking cliff, then I'm not going to put a beer into the market that isn't going to get picked up by a distributor for five days. It's a simple. Like, and no, you can't say that you care about your customer's experience of of your liquid and then off with your words. You can't say that with your words and then with your actions say... I'm going to make sure they don't get to touch the liquid for seven days. Mm-hmm. So I, fam- I internally I said we won't have an IP, a hazy IPA until we can sell direct to cus- consumers who can control the day that they drink that liquid. And then we had a double blind taste test, including Houston Hayes, right? From Houston Hayes and five percent tin, tin, and there were and I think there were some others on there. But the point is, is I tasted Houston Hayes and I thought it was Ryan's liquid and I went off the fucking deep end. This is beautiful. It's <laughs> magnificent. It's market ready. I knew you'd fucking kill the market. You're the goddamn poster child. I fucking love you. And then Ryan's like, yeah, that was Houston Hayes and this one was mine. And I looked at my notes and I was like, yeah, a couple <laughs> shots off goal before it's ready for market. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's what we do. But yeah. Houston Hayes is making some great spindle tap, and and our boys over there, Brody and, and I, I love them. They're yeah. making great fucking beer. Yeah, it's that goddamn simple. So I'm not going to launch in the hazy IPA when I got I got Dave Omar two blocks away. So this is a really deeply like don't fuck this up, Raz moment. Executive chef Arash. Arash fucking loves Zave's beer. That's a goddamn joke of it. So he he always just, he rides over there, buys a couple of four packs. I got them in my fridge right now because our chef is like, well, I love hazy IPAs. We're not making one. I'm going to go buy Dave's, yeah. you know? And, and, and so anyways, just to wax poetic and go on diatribes and whatever. And now meander close to the original premise of this departure. <laughs> Circling remotely close back to the zip code of what we were originally talking about, Uh I would just say, yes, we're calling it a brewery district because (laughs) we're doing different things. And you can make a fucking great day bouncing around these four places. And I know that because hashtag, (laughs) like not just a CEO, also a client, Mm. (laughs) like because our executive (laughs) chef on his fucking break jumps over to urban, urban South, gets drunker than I want him to, and then comes back and makes dinner. I mean, he doesn't if Houston's listening, but the greater point (laughs) is like, yeah, Dave Omar is making great fucking hazy IPAs. And until we can do it, we can do it. You you know, we're not going to do it. So, but yeah, I love those guys. Yeah. Fuck yeah. It's Houston brewery district. There we go. That's the answer. <laughs> My only question is how how big can a district get? Because what, the you, you, district? Yeah, like what? what's what's the footprint? I mean, if it's within walking distance, then yeah, I think you've got it about as that's that's a, y'all are about where you need to be. But when so if it's economists a economist will always talk about financial limitations to capacity. Mm-hmm. But I I would like to direct a different metric, creative limitations to capacity. So look, how saturated can a restaurant market get? If you were doing things that are you and authentically you, and you were doing them better than anyone is doing themselves, then you are competing against yourself and you are being your best self and no one can be better at you than you. It gets back to my fundamental rule number one about competition and about corporate strategy. We are a banana factory run by a bunch of monkeys. And if the monkeys in this banana factory think that we are making the best banana we can, it's a good enough banana for everyone else to be really fucking, everyone else will go monkeys over it. It's that simple. 
right? And then we have to believe that there are other monkeys in the actual world that are comparable to the monkeys in our ecosystem. So don't get in your ivy tower where you are, you know, a ridiculous, like, uh, meta-narrative of the real trend, right? Mm. But at the end of the day, to answer your question more directly, you look at, or, or less directly even, you look at 2002, right? So uh, you look in Colorado, I think Boulder Beer Company opened up in 1989. You had a glut of openings in the early aughts when you're talking about, or when you're talking about uh, New Belgium and Odell and, uh, and Great Divide and a lot of really great Colorado breweries. And then Oscar Blue showed up in the early aughts. I'm sorry, those were the 90s. Oscar Blue showed up 10 years later. In a time when you could say that the corporate landscape was saturated, Oscar Blues figured out that people want cans, mm. not bottles. They captured the zeitgeist. They listened to people. They delivered what they wanted, and they made it happen. Yellowtail delivered into the fucking... If you talk to me about skew proliferation in an, or, in an industry, I will turn to wine. Wine is the most profuse skew count of all things in the entire supermarket. We, there are more wines than cheeses. Yeah. Right? It doesn't get more proliferated than that. You got three types of peanut butters, 172 types of wine for each of your different, uh, like, self actualized uh, millennial emotional moments, right? I'm more in a boysenberry sort of feel tonight than a high tannic leather saddle direction. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna finish my my yeah, right? You know what I'm saying, uh, right? Yeah. It doesn't get more ridiculous than that, but Yellowtail got into the market and created a, a salient brand at the same time that these guys and these guys and these guys did too. You can still build brands in a saturated market if you are A authentic and B consistent and, 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 and just consistent on your niche. Mm -hmm. Know who you are. You know, and you know who said it better than any of us can say it, and I'll just stop with that, is Malcolm X said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's true for brand strategy as well. Yep. We're Buffalo fucking Bayou, and everyone in the fucking state of Texas knows exactly what we goddamn stand for. There's no dilution. There's no confusion. There's nothing else. Stand up for who you are, or you'll fall for anything. That, that's our marketing strategy. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Back to, maybe I should pour some more whiskey. This is going well. <laughs> no, I, that, I think um, you say it perfectly. I don't, I don't think that there's a, you know, if there's a theme for this episode, one, it's, uh, you know, what the hell's going on in this world. But then two, it's, uh, you know, to thine own self be true. Um, no, yes. You know. Polonius. Yeah. So there you go. Just, uh, you know, keep it real, bro. Can, can <laughs> I throw out a political ja a political uh, PSA? Yeah. You mentioned Polonius. Mm -hmm. And I'll point out that in the Kenneth Branagh version of Hamlet, Polonius was played by Bill Murray. And now I'm going to show my full cards, okay? Mm -hmm. So right now, it's Groundhog Day. I've had 38 consecutive Mondays, man. <laughs> like, I don't even know what the fuck Friday means now. Like, we shared a little diagram where my new definition of Friday is like, on Thursday, I can't drink beer until 6 p.m. On Friday, it's 11 a.m. <laughs> on Saturday, it's 6 a.m. Uh -huh. That's my new definition of the weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need the political leadership to drive us home for the long term. And that's why... You think about the leadership we need right now. Bill Murray has gone through Groundhog Day. And I think that that is a best example of leadership through what we're going through right now. So I'm going to throw it out there. You heard it here first, Josh. I'm going to be aggressively drafting for president and vice president. I'm talking Walker Murray 2020 because America needs more cabo and we need to get the fuck out of this Groundhog Day. And it's that goddamn simple. Yep. This is a leadership that will emerge, that will help the company, the country get out of this, this, this situation. I think, you know, walk in Murray 2020, man, you heard it here first. Yeah. No, I, I, listen, I throw my, I, 
I uh, hear your message. I endorse it. You know, yeah. thank you. Yeah. The, uh, the interbrews political action committee. We got our first actual media endorsement. Letting <laughs> Damien know. Okay. Yes, as uh, Rock and Murray 2020 endorsed. Yes, as as the he even uh, said to thy own own self be true, which was played by Bill Murray. That's a Polonius quote during Kenneth Branagh's version of Hamlet, played by Bill Murray. You were there before I was there, Josh. Mm. Thank you. We just met, and the other, and the other, just the other day, we watched What About Bob, and uh, yes, you know, so it's what about him. We're in the middle of a fucking storm. Yep. We're sailing. You know what? Yeah, uh, that's, that's an, it's a, I don't know if you know this, but I'm like white fucking trash born on welfare rural Maine, right? Mm -hmm. What about Bob was the first movie I convinced my mom to rent when we didn't have enough money to rent VHSs. Mm -hmm. We didn't even have a fucking VCR. We rented the video and then paid twenty dollars a day to rent the VCR because we couldn't buy it for a hundred yeah. bucks. And what? Oh no, it was yeah. Was it one of the uh, the top loaders? Yeah. 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 I remember renting the VCR. That was that was epic. from the supermarket. Yep. You know what's crazy? What the fuck is it going to be like 10 or 20 years trying to explain the internet to our children? Uh -huh. Like, no, so we did podcasts back then. Uh -huh. Dad, what's a podcast? Ah, <laughs> uh, do you know what a VA track is? <laughs> Are you familiar with the phrase fax machine? It was a similar concept. Yeah. Now we just feed directly into your skull where mm -hmm. Josh just tells 10, thousands of people what to do. Yep. That's, that's the next level, right? You're just going to micro feed into listener skulls directly. Yeah, I'm working on it. It's uh it's on the list. It's like one ad video to uh okay yeah. maybe a little bit different mic and then three uh direct interface with people's yeah. brains. Yeah. Well right now you go through the ears to trigger synapse releases. Uh huh. You can go you can vertically integrate deeper into the neuro oh sure I, easy. Yeah we we've looked at a lot of things. We've done uh we've looked at um you know, like a smell, like a thing, like a, like a smell release system, uh, anal probe, not going to get into that one so much. Uh, doesn't turns out, you know, like you said, you know, stay in your lane and, uh, you know, some other things, but yeah, we'll, uh, eventually, yeah, straight into the brain. So I've always had respect for how forward thinking you are cutting edge. Mm -hmm. I think that's the technology that's going to make it to the next decade. Would you, question is if let's say the only way they could get information directly into your brain was through an anal probe. Would you be on board? Fuck yeah. <laughs> Turns out that's the most direct route. So actually, I'm, I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass, but I am actually going to blow smoke up your ass. The reason I say fuck yeah, and, and I, was telling, I was telling Ryan before this, we were, we were talking about why we love your, your podcast. It's, it's, like, it's like Brewers Network too, and why we love these podcasts is because it's like, Sometimes in Facebook, the shit gets just dark and negative, and it's about drain pores, and it's about this, and it's about that. And it's like, come on, guys. Like, what the fuck, man? That's not why you got into it. That's not why we got into it. Why do people want to get these gotcha moments, you know? But, like, your your inner bruise has always been productive and, and, and about t telling stories and about connecting, about making it real, about giving a real conversation and about uh, human beings being human beings. And... And I, I fucking love that. So, yeah, I would beam this directly into my skull on Fetter. Thank you, Josh. I trust you on that one. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I think that's a, um, I don't know. I guess a good place to uh, wrap up this conversation. And um, I don't know. I, I got to set you about your day because I feel, um, I don't know. I don't want to take advantage of your time, but um, I, I feel like the people need you. The people need Buffalo Bayou and, uh, it's all available right now. Beer to go and uh, food to go and order online. Uh, go to buffbrew.com. Uh, what else do we need to know? Um, let's see. $12 bombers. What else do we have? Um, oh, 12 making, packs. Uh, making some great pizzas and some great burgers. And, uh, you're, oh, you're, I, I defy. You're super safe to come up and, and buy food to go. We're, I, we, you can you can buy food to go online, and you can do a future order too. So you can just set it up to be picked up a couple of days in advance if you want, even. Oh, that's so. beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, and I'll, 
I love that y'all have the the twelve packs. Twelve packs are great. They feel like you like a like you feel like a businessman with your with your briefcase with the twelve pack. You know, in your, in your yeah, head, you that's know? right. So you can get to work. To do some fucking business and let them <laughs> figure out what's about to come out of this briefcase. Yeah. Well, sir, I thought the negotiation was going to go like this, and then, <laughs> boom, I got a quarantine kit, and I mean business. <laughs> Yes, this is, thank you, Josh. I appreciate you letting everyone how to maximize capitalism. Capitalism, That's yep. way to go. <laughs> <Beautiful>. <laughs> All right, well, there you go. Get your business done by going to uh, Buffalo Bayou, buffbrew.com, put your order in. I defy you to look at those pictures on their Facebook page of the pizzas and the burgers and everything. I defy you to look at those and then not let your stomach growl. Impossible. It's uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful looking, and then once you put it in your mouth, then it's then next level. You've uh, you've gone off into heaven. So uh, um, thank you. Yeah, do that, and all the good beers, all the beers. So uh, guys, thank y'all so much for uh, being on my podcast today. Thank you for doing what you do, Josh. Getting the word out and let the letting the people understand uh, what what we're trying to do. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll let you uh, get about your day. And uh, Ryan, sir, continue making that delicious beer. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Razul, uh, keep being beautiful. And uh, to Troy, wherever he may be at this point, uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, vacation. I think we know where he is. <laughs> I think we know what's in his right hand and his left hand. Yeah. So uh, There's nothing wrong with that. It's vacation, baby. It is vacation. It. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank so, you for having us. Oh, absolutely. Anytime, really anytime, uh, especially through all of this, I'm available anytime. So if you wake up at 3 a.m. in a panic and just need to talk about uh, business strategies and uh, why you're not going to deliver beer or anything like that, just know that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pipeline. And just know you done fucked up on that one, buddy. <laughs> you got my number. I'll be there. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. All right, everybody. Looking forward to making you regret that one. All right. Uh, yeah, that'll be fun. I will hit record, though. So just know. <laughs> I love you, buddy. All right. Thank love you, you so too. much, Doc. All right, everybody. Buffalo Bayou uh, online orders and, uh, you know, forever Buff, Buff Brew. Just go get it and uh, enjoy. And thank you, Razul. Thank you. Ryan, thank you. and thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. So for the crew at Buff, Buff Brew, Buffalo Bayou, and everybody in the Brewers District, uh, I'm Josh, and this is Interbrews. This is Interbrews. The preceding has been a presentation of Stewed Productions. <laughs>